So in summary, we now have a second order ordinary differential equation to solve, or at least if we're trying to solve it in one dimension, it's, it's a, it's a um, ordinary differential equation. So we've got a second order ordinary differential equation, um, that's our Poisson-Boltzmann equation, um, that is basically the La Laplacian of our electrostatic potential equals some term that involves the, ch the local charge imbalance. Um, but that char charge imbalance actually contains a term that has the electrostatic potential in it in an inside of an exponential. Um, we can identify the two boundary conditions as um, one boundary condition being that the electrostatic potential in the bulk is zero, but then another one that defines the gradient um, in terms of the um, surface charge density. So the problem here is that this generally, this is a nonlinear um, equation and it generally requires a computational solution, um, which would mean probably an iterative um, solution of some sort. Um, there is a little bit of um, progress we can make that people typically do, um, though not always completely justifiably. Um, if it turns out that the electrostatic potential is small um, relative to the temperatures that you're working at, um, all the way up until the surface, um, so, so typically the largest um, value of the, the, at least the largest absolute value of the chemical, of the, of the electrostatic potential would be at the surface. So really what I'm saying is the surface um, potential should be fairly low. Um, if that's the case, then um, you can write the exponential term that appears inside the summation instead as 1 minus z times the elemental charge times um, the potential divided by kBT. And the important part there is that, you know, when I make that simplification, the electrostatic potential appears as a linear term. So that idea is called the Debye-Huckel approximation and it allows you to get a lot farther. So let's use that idea and, um, you know, plug it into our, our uh, Poisson-Boltzmann equation. Then we'll note that there's a term, there's two terms inside the parentheses. And what we can do is rearrange that equation to put all of the things that involve phi on one side. So let me create a big bracket here um, that's got some stuff in it. Um, so I'll pull out one side that just has the prefactors of phi. Um, so that involves, uh, you know, a summation, blah, blah, blah. Um, that with phi as a prefactor, and then I'll leave all of the other stuff as a um, as a right hand side. Now, what you'll notice about the stuff left on the right hand side um, is that there's something kind of cool about what's going on inside the summation. So that's a summation that is essentially over the net charge in the bulk of the fluid. Well, guess what? We, you're charge neutral in the bulk of a fluid. And so it turns out that the right-hand side, when you do things that way, um, is exactly equal to zero. So if I write that out a little bit more compactly, um, oh, I think I've made a mistake up here. So underneath that bracket term, um, I wrote KD, but that should actually be something called KD squared. Um, and it, Okay, anyway, if I write this all out in one dimension, um, I'll, I'll find a pretty simple solution here, which is that phi equals some constant prefactor times e to the minus kd times x. Often this is written a little bit differently, um, so we'll write it as phi s times e to the minus x over ld. Now the quantity um, phi s is called the zeta potential. Um, we'll talk a little bit about the zeta potential in a little bit. And the quantity LD is called the Debye screening length, which is an extremely important quantity for lots of different types of physics, not just um, charge double errors. So the Debye screening length, if I follow my definition of KD and, and invert it, um, involves the square root of the permeativity times KBT divided by uh, a portion of that involves basically the summation of the charge squared times the, um, the bulk um, uh, number, charge number density. Um, 